So let's dive right in. We begin with Congresswoman Nia Love. From combating human trafficking to proposing an overhaul of the criminal justice system, Congresswoman Love has made a name for herself as an advocate for bipartisanship joining, uh, since she joined Congress in 2014. She's also a history-making member of the House of Representatives, serving as the first African-American female Republican member of Congress. Welcome, Congresswoman Love. And And joining her is my colleague, The Hill's Editor-in-Chief, Bob Cusack. Bob, over to you. Thanks, Johanna. Uh, and, and Congresswoman, thanks for coming tonight. I'm excited. This um, is going to be fun. A couple current events uh, issues uh, I want to touch on first is uh, tax reform, moving on Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. uh, and a spending showdown. Do you think that tax reform will pass before Christmas? And do you think that uh, leaders can avoid a government shutdown? Well, gosh, I hope they avoid a government shutdown. That's never good for anybody. Um, and as for predicting whether we can pass it, I, I certainly hope so. Mm -hmm. um, we stopped predicting a while ago. From <laughs> we, um, you know, the American people have their own minds, and uh, things tend to shift and change. But I think tax reform is something that has to happen. I mean, we. Uh, I think for a while we've held the American people hostage, have taxed them way too much, and we need to do everything we can to, to get some sort of simplicities, get the economy moving again, and working as much as we possibly can for the American people. Another big issue in the news has been sexual harassment, and specifically the process that Congress has uh, dealing with that, which a lot of people say is unfair, and it's been really not, no one's really been paying attention to it. Does the whole process of uh, reporting uh, claims of harassment need to be revamped? Well, this is something that I've been incredibly involved in since all of the, um, some of the allegations have come out. First of all, it's absolutely unacceptable for women or anyone to be victimized, harassed, sexually assaulted by anybody ever, especially um, by members of Congress who we should hold to a higher standard. I mean, they're out there, they're representing people, and um, I think it's important that we are examples of, of, um, of who we represent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot that, that people are looking at and things that need to be shifted. And I think that one of the things that we need to do is prevent any further cases by making sure that members of Congress are accountable. Um, we also have to be careful. I've, also, I've always said this, too. We have to be careful that um, we don't start accusing based on um, we don't want to politicize it. And we certainly don't want to do that for uh, any personal gain, because victims that are out there, it, it normalizes the situation. And uh, we want to make sure that people who are assaulted or who are harassed actually um, have, are able to find recourse and are able to make themselves whole and at least tell their story. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a member, and he said that, a uh, member of the House, and he said that some members of the opposite party don't even say hello to him in the hallways. You were elected in 2014. Has partisanship gotten worse or better? Why are we in such a polarizing time, and, and who is to blame? I think everyone. <laughs> I, I really do. I think everyone is to blame. You have to understand that I come from the lens of local government, where, as a mayor, um, I, my, that seat was nonpartisan. And in the 10 years that I was in municipal government, not one issue was a Republican or a Democrat issue. Hmm. Not one. It's not like you can fix one side of the road and not fix the other side of the road. We all went to the same schools. Um, our kids went to the same schools. We shopped at the same stores. And so uh, I think that if we had a little bit more of that in Washington, we would be able to solve more problems. I think that the political parties make people choose sides. Um, I think that the media, I think that there are a lot of interested institutions that come into play and tell people what to think before they're able to get the information themselves and digest the information themselves. I can't tell you how many times we've actually, I haven't even seen legislation yet, and you've got think tanks out there telling everybody, you know, whether they support it or not, right? So um, I think this is one of the reasons, one of the ways that I think that we can stop it is... Um, uh, this is a, a bill that has been introduced that I really wish that we can support. It's called One Subject at a Time. It's a simple bill where you have the title, um, you, you, the bill, the subject has to be clearly stated in the title, and it 
allows people to be able to, first of all, simplify it and read the bill themselves mm -hmm. instead of waiting for somebody to tell them what to think about it. It makes it so that members of Congress can't put their pet projects in a bill at the last minute. And here's the biggest thing. When you've got complica complicated bills, it forces members of Congress to vote for something they said that they would never vote for because it's attached to something that they said that they would mm -hmm. always vote for. We've got to stop that. We have to simplify the process and get people. We've got to allow transparency and get people engaged in the process. And they could use their own thought process, their own minds to make a decision for themselves. You have to remember the House of Representatives is supposed to be the branch that's closest to people. Mm -hmm. I take that very seriously, which is why, you know, um, I've never allowed anyone to put me in a box. Yes, I'm conservative. Yes, I'm a Republican. But I am not afraid to stand on my own to do what's right. Most issues for me, it's not a left or right issue. It's a right and wrong issue. And, and I, I, I looked up all the lawmakers who are here tonight, including you. Yes. And, and you have signed on to a fair amount of Democratic bills, whether it's uh, Bobby Scott, Ted Lieu, Terry Sewell, Vet Clark. There's a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, are they surprised when a conservative like you gets on their bills? Well, um, again, I'm, I'm first and foremost a mother. I'm a wife. I'm an American, first and foremost. So when I look at a bill and I look at the issue on its own, I'm not looking at who's sponsoring it and what letter they have on the back of their names. I'm, I'm sitting there looking at, is this good for my children? Is it good for the people that I represent? And is it good for America? And I think that we have a responsibility we've forgotten. We have a responsibility to each other here. You know, we're all Americans, right? Um, we're doing everything we possibly can to try and provide opportunities for not just ourselves, but for the people that we love. And I have to tell you that we have to use our talents and our gifts for the betterment of society, not just for us and our families, but for everyone. And so I try and do that with every issue that I look at. I have to be an example to my children. At the end of the day, I can go to sleep and I can say, you know, to my kids, I did what was best. I didn't do what was best for the party. I did what was best for them and the people that I represent. Along those lines, you are the only Republican member of the Congressional Black Caucus. Yes. Was that awkward at first? And, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, now I see that a lot of the, the bills you've signed on to are, are members of the CBCs. Yeah. So has it formed relationships that maybe other members can't do because they're not part of a group like that? You know, I think first and foremost, if you're going to be a leader, you have to get comfortable in what would be a seemingly uncomfortable space. Uh -huh. And so um, there were a lot of people that said, Mia, don't go. They're going to hate you. And I have to tell you, it's the best thing that I've done. Because when you, people come from different walks of life and they have different experiences. Experiences that I don't have. And the biggest problem with members of Congress is that they think they know everything. <laughs> they do. And it's not, that's that not, goes that's for a not lot of true, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. certainly not true. You have to be open and you have to be able to say, okay, Tell me where, what your perspective is. Tell me where you've come from. And I've built some great relationships, so much so that I've got a member of the CBC that actually endorsed my campaign. It took a lot of courage for them to do that. But he said, you know, I think it's important to have people of color on both sides of the aisle. And I've learned a lot. And let me. And the, the relationship is really good mutually because you know, not only do they help me, but I help them. You know, when we're talking about tax reform, mm -hmm. I said, OK, tell me what your top three. And if I agree with them, I'm going to go and get some votes there. Uh, child deduction was a big issue for them. You know, the mortgage deduction, different things. So I went over to my side and made sure that we got some of those things in the bill. Mm -hmm. And it may not be something that they voted for at the end of the day, but they got a piece of it that was really good. You know, and they wouldn't have, they, it, it's, it's been a really good um, relationship and, and there are people that are actually on the CBC that um, have become, that will be lifelong friends of mine. Hmm. Yeah, and that member, David Scott, when he gave you a $1,000 donation, a Democrat. <laughs> yes. You thought he was joking at first. <laughs> well, I was just like, are you, are you serious? He's like, yes, I'm absolutely serious. And you have to understand, this is somebody who decided to ignore what people were telling him on the political side mm -hmm. and said, I just felt like it's important for me to stand with you. Um, and that, to me, gave me so much hope for this process. I'm going to get a little emotional, because what a great person, um, a great human being that 
took a lot of political heat, but did what he felt was right, and I will forever be grateful. It tells a lot about who he is. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, when you think about bipartisanship, President Obama ran as, as a postpartisan uh, president, and, and it didn't pan out that way. Mm -hmm. um, and really, from the get-go, whether it was the stimulus, no matter who you blame, uh, Republicans, by and large, didn't vote for the stimulus. None of them voted for Obamacare. Conversely, after President Trump won, no Democrat voted to repeal Obamacare, and no Democrat, it looks like, will vote for this tax cut bill. Um, where, from a presidential standpoint, uh, you, you want to appeal to your base. And the left and the right are very strong right now. The Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party, even though it's technically not a Democrat, and, and President Trump um, with the Tea Party's popular with his base. Um, what do you think that at the presidential level, you, 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 is that the person who most has to lead on bipartisanship? Uh, and what are the keys? The president? The president, yes. Okay, well, I can tell you this. I think the time to look to the White House and even to Washington for answers, that time is gone. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. As a matter of fact, when people ask me, what do you think about the president's tweet? What do you think about this? I'm like, my kids are looking at my tweet. They're looking at what I say and how I conduct myself. So I'm not waiting for somebody to tell me how to react or how to behave. The other thing I, I would like to say is that when people, I get colleagues that say you have to stand behind the president's agenda. You know, whether you like the president or not, he has to stand behind our agenda. We're the legislative branch. Mm -hmm. Get back. I mean, you get back to the Constitution. And you think Article One of the Constitution says Congress is the one that is supposed to, you know, write the laws, and the president is supposed to um, ex execute the laws. And I think that people would be less afraid of what's happening in the White House if we actually had our members of Congress that we elect that are accountable to us making the decisions. I think too much power is consolidated in the White House. And that's another area where I can agree with everyone. Everyone can agree with that. They can, they can sit there and say, you know what, there's too much power up there. So um, you know, when it comes to leadership, I think if everyone's looking to the White House for leadership, whether you like the president or not, you are looking at the wrong person. Look at yourself. You know, look at how you are going to influence the world. Look at how you're going to behave instead of waiting for somebody to tell you how to think, how to feel. Um, be an example of civility. Be an example of respect. We're missing some of that um, in the United States. So, is it also uh, because everyone is looking to the next election, even the day after an election? I, <laughs> Well, um, I'd be making decisions certainly differently if I were worried about every single election. At the, again, at the end of the day, I, I feel good about who I am, what I've done. Um, I can be an example to my children. And um, I'll share a really uh, quick experience mm -hmm. with you. I had an experience where I got an opportunity to go and speak at the University of Chicago. And everybody just kept saying, no, don't go. They will hate you. That's Obama territory. They're going to eat you alive. And they asked me about my life, and I told them about my parents and my life coming here, and um, about my parents coming here. I was born in New York, uh, raised under these principles that my parents get, um, you know, told me about and raised me under. And this one woman stood up, and she said, I don't understand how you could be a black, female, Mormon, Republican living in Utah in today's society. And I said, OK, I know that sounds weird, but I said, I refuse. I am all those things because I refuse to fit a mold that society tells me to fit into. Mm -hmm. Imagine if people like Martin Luther King um, decided to just take that government said he was a second class citizen. We wouldn't be here today. So I don't need anyone to believe in my thoughts. But for crying out loud, I need everyone to preserve the right to think for themselves. Because one of the things I do not like is when somebody thinks that if you don't think like me, then you know, you're not worth listening to. Where the best bills that I have supported have come from people who think differently than I do. We just come at it from a different perspective. But the goal should be the same, mm -hmm. is the same. And so that's how I see, that's how I see this. That's how I see this play out. We have to be an example. And I just, I don't allow anyone to put me in a box. I never have. And I'm not going to start. We're going to open it up to questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. And uh, we have uh, people with uh, mics 
And if you can just identify yourself and ask the As question. long as they're nice questions. <laughs> All right, well, I'll change it now, I guess. No, I'm uh, so, hi, my name is Jasper Vandenberg. I'm a, a GMU student Did studying. Did you say Gasper? Yesper, like Jesper. yes, cats Jesper. per. Got yeah, it. And that's how you remember. Uh, so I'm a GMU graduate student studying international security, and that's okay. definitely one area where the executive branch holds pretty much all the cards. So mm -hmm. do you see that there's like a lot of political will in Congress to sort of reassert and get back involved in that conversation? Because obviously, you know, finances and legislation play a huge part in national right. security. Uh, is there any sort of will in there? Or is it more just like, no, we're just going to keep deferring to what the executive branch well, I, I know from, from the circles of people I speak to, um, all around, we're trying to do everything we can to make sure we remove that power that's being consolidated in the White House. Remember, uh, we've got people that are making decisions for us that aren't elected by us and certainly not accountable to us. And we've got to start, no matter where you are on the political spectrum, we have got to start putting power back into people into their say and what they what they ask. So if you are one of my constituents, you should be able to come to me and say, I need you to go and represent me this way. I need you to go and speak up for me, right? And we should have some recourse and make sure that we can at least have a voice. Because if the person that you, rep you elected doesn't have a voice, then you are completely voiceless in Washington. We've got to bring power back to people. Question right there. Good evening, my name is Yamala Payano. I'm a senior here at American University. Um, and my question goes back to the one subject bill that you just brought up. Yeah. Um, it, don't you think that not attaching bills might actually increase um, or made it harder for people in, in everywhere to communicate, just because I think that um, if we look at the DACA issue right now, they're trying to attach it to the um, finance bill. And I think that if it wasn't for that, there wouldn't be any conversation around it. OK, so great point. Here's the problem in Washington. The bigger the bill, the more people say, I'm out because there's a deal breaker in there. If we start simplifying things, then they stand on their own. So I think that, for instance, we might get some people that aren't supportive of whether it's the DREAM Act or the RAC Act because it's attached to something else, where those people would actually support those bills if they stood on their own. Does that make sense? So the bigger, think about the bills that have been the most difficult. They've been the big comprehensive bills, your health care, tax reform, different things like that. But you have simple bills. Those are the ones that get the most bipartisan support. So I'm just trying to simplify things so that way people can stand on their own. They can look at some issues. And, and these laws should be able to stand on their own. You can't take a must-pass bill and say, I'm going to attach a whole bunch to it. Um, and you've got all of a sudden a 2,000, uh, you know, or even, let's say, a 100-page bill that you have to read within three days and really understand, digest, and dissect. I mean, we've got staff members that can dissect it, but we're talking about laws that affect the American people. Somebody should be able to read it at their kitchen table and say, call their member of Congress and say, you know what, I support this or I don't support this, and be able to make that decision on their own. This is about transparency. And the bigger the bill, the less transparency there is. Uh, let's see, uh, last question right here. We're going to stick with this area here. <laughs> no complaints from me. All right. Uh, Congresswoman, thank you very much. Um, I was reading up on some of the work you've done on counter-human trafficking. And first off, I really appreciate it. And thank you. And it was um, part of why I wanted to go into foreign policy based on things I'd seen while studying abroad. Yeah. And uh, with this is a bit of a niche question, but especially with Russia in the news, I hope it's relevant to your interests. Um, a lot of bad actors trying to uh, penetrate our own, um, you know, our infrastructure, uh, information assurance, yeah. um, uh, and of course the straight up human. Uh, these these bad actors, whether they're state or non-state, have links to a lot of criminal networks. Yeah. Could you comment in uh, on the role of? our intelligence community, but also especially counterintelligence. What is the role of counterintelligence in combating human trafficking that you've been exposed to, and of course, what you can talk about? OK, so that is a three-hour conversation I'm going to try and condense to about a minute or so. 
we have a responsibility first to do no harm, right? We have a responsibility first and foremost to keep the Amer Americans safe. It's in our constitution, right? We're supposed to make sure that we have national defense. National defense also includes information. Um, we've seen a lot of breaches lately, um, whether it's Equifax or whether it's uh, y you name it. We've got a, I'm on financial institutions and we're seeing these bre breaches all the time. We have got to do everything we can. It is the job of government to make sure that they're protecting the American people. We've got to be able to protect information. We are vulnerable. There are people that are out there that want to see us harmed. They don't care what party we belong to. They just hate Americans, period. They hate our way of life. They hate the fact that we are, you know, are, are just our philosophy. Um, about life, so we've got to do everything we can. Um, counterintelligence is incredibly important. I don't think we need to, we shouldn't take our eyes off the ball. I'm going to say this. Um, I'm going to do a Ronald Reagan quote. Hopefully everybody here can at least like Ronald Reagan. But I've always gone through, I've always believed in, you know, when he said, the world will experience peace when the United States is a beacon of strength. And that, to me, means that we are doing everything we can to make sure that we are protecting um, Americans um, when it comes to information security and also um, when it comes to our national defense. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have run out of time. Please thank the Congresswoman for coming here tonight. I hand it over to Joanne. Thank you so much.